Um, so uh, I did want to give anyone else who might be wondering in a couple minutes, but it seems like we have a gelled crowd and we're at time, so uh, I guess I'll kick things off. Press the red button. Yes, I have. Okay. Um, the, uh, so welcome to Life on the Edge. Uh, this is a bit of a perennial talk that I've given mostly at this camp specifically, uh, covering the, um, the experiences that we see among customers on the platform at Pantheon um, and in my involvement with the industry around um, products like CDNs, uh, public clouds, etc. cetera. Um, what my aim is in this session is not just to educate you on the engineering concerns around having a properly configured and optimized edge, but to also equip you with a lot of the business case for investing the effort there in terms of understanding why a customer will want to spend time on investing in their edge configuration and what advantages it actually gives a site, no matter what the goals of the site actually are. So um, I'll just introduce myself. Um, I've uh, been involved in Drupal since 2007, maybe 2006, I, 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 something like that. My first DrupalCon was in Boston in 2008, but uh, I had actually ar already been involved with the community for at least a year or two before that. Um, I am currently serving on the Drupal security team, primarily involved with the auto updates project. Um, I'm also a contributor to SystemD at the low level of the Linux, low levels of the Linux system, and I also used to be um, the MySQL maintainer for Drupal back when that was a role. Um, the so I'm going to actually kick off right away with the business case because like almost none of this stuff matters if you can't convince someone to invest in it, whether it's a prioritization question, a budget question, etc. Um, this has to matter, and um, it. It, it, and honestly, you need to be able to convince yourself that it matters too, and test a lot of the work and priorities that you give to things against these sorts of goals, because there's an infinite amount of ways that you can improve a website, and the vast majority of the time investment you can make is actually not going to move the needle. So um, it's, it's also a question of how far to move the needle. Like, at what point do you get diminishing returns? So um, the first thing is, I used to have a slide years back on this on the case for doing HTTPS, but there's no longer really a question of whether you deploy HTTPS. It's been a ranking signal for 10 years now for Google. It's um, essential for user trust in terms of responsibly handling people's data. And it's necessary in a lot of cases for you to be well aligned with various compliance frameworks, whether we're talking about uh, personal information, industry specific systems, etc. So uh, I'm not gonna dwell on this. Um, I don't need to make the case for HTTPS anymore. It's the question is how to deploy it properly and what performance implications it can have with different edge decisions you make. Um, uh, I also want to make the case that like, I used to talk a lot about time to first bite because it used to be an important signal in terms of the site ranking. Um, I usually include most of the updates toward the end of this deck, but I'm including this up front because it used to be something that I used to make the case in terms of why you needed to care about deployment in conjunction with CDNs. Time to first byte is no longer the reason that you should actually deploy to a CDN. It's, it's a, an important measure we'll talk about for why you need to care about it internally, but it is not driving your results on its own. Um, this has been replaced with substantially more comprehensive measures, both for search engine ranking and in terms of what we actually need to care about for user psychology. Um, Google basically uses PageSpeed Insights at this point. Um, PageSpeed Insights is a telemetry system that is integrated with Chrome. Google technically has opened it up to other browsers if they want to submit data to it, but the only implementer of it today, I believe, is Chrome. Uh, in practice, this means that across use of your sites on Chrome browsers, both mobile and desktop, they, there is aggregate telemetry data getting collected about the experience that users have on the site. Um, now, some of the measures I'm talking about here are really the correlated ones from Lighthouse, and I'll, I'll explain the difference between these things. It's important to understand what we're aiming to achieve here as we start looking at ways to engineer that achievement. But basically, um, you need to get good results on real-world end-user devices at this point. Um, there are no shortcuts where you can convince the Google bot that your site is fast if it's not actually loading fast for real users. Um, they have tried to close the gap almost completely on anything you could do to trip up the system without delivering real-world performance to users. 
This is mostly a good thing. Uh, in fact, this ranking signal has been a part of Google's framework for more than five years now. Um, they started with caring about it on mobile. It, initially, they introduced it where mobile devices were getting search results that were ranked uh, by empirical, empirical measured performance in Chrome. This has since been expanded to the desktop. Uh, basically, this has supplanted measures like time to first byte and um, things that the Google bot itself measures as it's visiting your page. Uh, what this means is that it's not actually the visits by the Google bot that are measuring the performance on your site at this point. It's aggregated data from visitors that are actually humans using Chrome that then gets fed back into Google. Google matches that against the actual data they've collected from, uh, from their bot, and then they use that so that the information they've harvested with the bot combined with the empirical data they've collected from users browsing to the site is informing the ranking. And it's a pretty substantial signal. Um, it, uh, it can really vary, um, I believe, uh, let me see where the, um, I don't know if we actually have up-to-date data on like, I, I think I might've looked for it and couldn't find detailed data on exactly how much each little bit of performance affects your ranking. I think it's different quite a bit depending on what your peer sites are. Because of course, if your peer sites are very slow, you don't have to be that fast to be at the top of results. But if your peer sites are very fast, then you are going to have a bit of a Thunderdome competition for performance. Um, Google cares about a lot of this stuff, not just because they've decided to care about it. They've noticed that users have all sorts of navigation behaviors associated with the uh, objective and subjective experience of performance. And I'll, I'll get into what I mean by that in a, in a second. But first I want to distinguish between these frameworks and tools that, that Google uses. And there are other ones out there. I'm being pretty Google specific, but the, the this, um, all search engines at this point that are major have some sort of performance measure as part of their ranking signals. So it's by optimizing for these frameworks, you're probably optimizing for the most comprehensive one and you will probably fare well on other search engines as well. So I mentioned that PageSpeed Insights is based on telemetry data from, from re real world browsers. Um, that means that you don't actually have access to, um, to PageSpeed Insight data for a revision of a page. If you decide to do a performance optimization and want to see how much it will improve the site, PageSpeed Insights can't tell you that until it's been deployed for a bit of time. It will, it's a lagging measure in the sense that it, it's collecting data from users using the site. Um, that means it's super comprehensive in the sense of measuring the actual network conditions that real users are loading the pages under, the kind of devices they're loading them under, etc but it won't help you like actually do something like QA, a change to the site to see if it actually results in a benefit. That's where Lighthouse comes in. Lighthouse simulates many of the conditions that PageSpeed Insights collects data under. Uh, Lighthouse creates simulated loading activity for a site, both in terms of limited CPU, limited um, bandwidth, perhaps other limitations in terms of things like latency, and it tries to create, under simulated real-world conditions, an experience of loading a page on things like a mobile device, on a desktop, on a tablet, on a slow phone, on a great internet connection, on a poor internet connection. And what that means is like it's a great tool for evaluating the changes that you're making. And what I would encourage is you to look at tools like Lighthouse in order to be able to make progress as you implement some of the techniques we'll be describing here. Um, because, and, and then what you should see is that if you move the needle on Lighthouse with an optimization, deploy it, you should then start seeing numbers come in with PageSpeed Insights showing that you actually can um, have resulted in genuine real world impact. So that's a nice closed loop. Like, it's always great to evaluate yourself as an engineer in the sense of I want to create an outcome, I'm going to use the strategy to create the outcome, here's how I'm measuring the outcome um, in terms of the, the expected change to it, and here's how I'm measuring the, the actual real world performance of, of that change. So the, you kind of have to do both. Um, 
I believe PageSpeed Insights is primarily available through Google's Webmaster Tools, uh, Website Owner Tools, etc. Lighthouse, on the uh, on in contrast, is directly available through Chrome as well as through hosted configurations where you can just do trial runs. Uh, Lighthouse also provides you with additional data that PageSpeed Insights will not. Um, if you have aims around things like accessibility uh, on your site, then, uh, then Lighthouse will give you data on some of that uh, in ways that PageSpeed Insights will not. There's, if, in the Venn diagram of these two tools, the main overlap is on things like the performance of the page in terms of the first meaningful paint, um, the, uh, any sort of layout shifts that are happening during paint. These are evaluating you not just on performance, but um, to penalize sites for obnoxious techniques as well. Uh, in the sense that if you think that you can get a performance gain on a site with something like these tools by loading only the skeleton of the page and then having it asynchronously pull the content and fill it in, like you're not going to win on this because um, you will, uh, it, the first meaningful paint is the main measure it's using on this stuff and that's when it basically waits until the page has, is settled and then it looks at what time from navigating to the page to the page getting settled did most of the content actually arrive. Uh, additionally, if you fill in content in some sort of asynchronous way like that and you get the layout shift, um, that counts against your score in terms of cum cumulative layout shift. So basically, you want the page to be fast, you want the page to um, load all of its assets quickly, you want the page to load completely as quickly as possible, and then the final thing that I didn't really mention yet is you don't want it to be overly burdened with things like JavaScript and other analytics frameworks that prevent interaction with the page because you're also getting measured against how long from navigation and painting of the page to meaningful user interaction, like say scrolling, clicking on buttons, et cetera. Because if you load a whole bunch of frameworks, especially if you don't load them the right way, what you'll end up doing is not just delaying um, the loading of the page for uh, painting of it, but you'll, you'll often be creating a lag for interactions to the page. So this is designed to model a combination of human psychology and web best practices. And um, you should have both tools in your toolbox with basically every site you build. Um, the reason I start with this and talk about search engine ranking um, is that um, it's, a human, it's a human psychology factor for like what people click. Like there's a reason why people who optimize for search engines care about that so much, why so much money goes into it. And I'm not gonna dwell on this a bunch, but like you can basically see that like um, as the organic search position declines, you get a much, much lower click-through rate. And this click-through rate that you lose here will not show up in your analytics because your analytics cannot track a user starting at the search results, but only once they've clicked over to your site. Um, this is what I like to spend a little bit more time on with the human psychology factor of this. There's kind of a magic threshold for humans. Uh, it's about 2.4 seconds for loading a page, and that's the threshold when you start seeing substantial drops in conversion rates, basically no matter what you're expecting someone to do with a site. It doesn't matter whether you want them to sign up for a volunteer position, buy a product, um, sign up for a webinar. Um, Anything that you want your users to do on your site is going to be harmed by them having a, a slow experience on loading the pages that actually affect that experience. And that means that um, every second you're adding there is really causing a plummet to that conversion rate. So even if you are where you want to be on the search ranking, let's say that your, your peer sites are not very fast, you still need to care about you still need to care about the experience that users have once they actually click to your site because this doesn't change. Like having other sites and competitors that are slow doesn't change the fact that someone may abandon entirely and not just choose not to engage. 2.4 seconds is about the threshold when users start getting anxious and start doing things like switching to another app on their phone to buy the time while a page loads. It means they start wondering whether they're going to have an effective experience, whether the site's up. Um, as you start to get towards six seconds, um, you start, it, it starts to actually flatten a bit, the effect, in the sense that users who are very determined to use the site will still use it and generally wait until anything except, uh, until like a timeout even. 
Um, but uh, that's that's actually like you're looking at something like about a third to a quarter of the original conversion rate. You've lost 75% of eyeballs by the time that you have gone from 2.4 seconds to 5.7. And this is not the time for Drupal to send the page back. This is the time for it to render in the browser, um, which if Drupal sending the page is the start of that race, if you look at the, the tree on, say, something like Firefox or Chrome and developer tools for all the network resources used to load a page, and I'll go over some examples with that, it causes a cascading effect. So we, we're dealing with a situation where Drupal has to return a page pretty quickly or whatever infrastructure does, and the assets have to come back quickly. And I'm here to make the case that you really can't accomplish this without effective integration of a CDN, at least over a wide geographic area. Um, this is just more data on like basically um, uh, corroborating the idea that as load times increase, bounce rates increase. This has been validated by Google, by Amazon. Uh, it, it almost doesn't matter um, at this point what you're doing on your site. People get frustrated after more than a few seconds. Um, and I was mentioning this around the analytics, but I sometimes like to look at this as uh, what marketing and salespeople call a funnel, which the funnel is the idea of you have the breadth at the top where you are looking at your initial, say, addressable market, people searching for your stuff. Um, I like to include the clicking on the search result as the silent top of the funnel in the sense that you can't track it in your analytics, but it's absolutely affecting who ends up on the site. After a user clicks a result, they have to wait for a page load. That needs to really come in that less than 2.4 seconds. Um, and the only then are you really looking at having being in a good position to have users convert. Like if you're if you're worried about A B testing on a page, like am I do I have the language quite right? Like you might be misfocused if you haven't nailed this stuff yet because you're losing somewhere between 25 to 75% of your eyeballs on the site and potential convertees on the site simply by the performance challenges that people experience. So this is the case for your clients to invest in this or if, if you own the site for you to invest in this. It doesn't matter what your goal is. Um, so wrapping up the aspect of how do we measure success on this stuff, um, of course, there's the question of does, it, does the site meet your business value requirements? Like the, the fastest page in the world is pretty much an empty HTML page, but it's not it, that delivered statically, but it's not actually going to meet any of your business requirements. So all of that always has to be incorporated in this process. You can't do all of this optimization before you know what the site need to know before you know what the site needs to do. Uh, then getting into these other aspects, um, does the sort site score well in Lighthouse metrics? Um, that covers that umbrella of everything from performance to uh, obnoxious activity on the paint of the page or with user interaction all the way to accessibility. And that's a leading metric in the sense that you could be measuring before you deploy whether your Lighthouse score is going to go, is likely is going up or down from the deployment of the page. And then you have PageRank Insights, which is a um, a trailing metric, uh, which is giving you the idea of for your deployed site and the visitors going to that site, how is the page performing? Um, and then of course it has to stay online. Um, like the uptime of the infrastructure is key to people converting and a page that never loads is a page that takes, that is going to lose a conversion. Um, but they, I bring these up because like, this isn't just a, a list of things that you should do. This is a list of things that you can know when you're done too in the sense that uh, I don't want, performance and scalability optimization should not be an endless rabbit hole. It's something where you should achieve a certain benchmark and then move on because there are other things you can do to improve a site other than performance. Um, so a lot of this gets into like how HTTPS gets deployed to a site. Um, presumably everyone in this room has their sites deployed on HTTPS at this point. Um, the question still remains depending on how a site is deployed, especially in, if you're in larger organizations, for whether that HTTPS is terminated at a CDN, whether it's terminated at the origin server, whether that's true for regular pages, whether that's true for static assets. It's probably important for you to actually terminate HTTPS for all purposes, including pages and static assets on a CDN at this point. 
um, have uh, hybrid approaches that have been popular in the past um, around like using a CDN to cache the static assets, but having the regular pages go right to something like Drupal will underperform, even though you will get a lot of advantage from a CDN. So uh, let's go over like the structure of these requests and why um, why CDNs matter, why you can't, there's no way to optimize an origin server enough to actually handle these goals. The fundamental thing that this all comes down to is um, round trips times round trip time. Um, basically, like if you have a bunch of errands to run in terms of shopping trips, you know that you have several different stores to go to. You would be you would be measuring how long does it take me to get each store to each store to get back from each store and how many stores do I need to go to. And um, this is a slightly simpler equation with most websites if you have one destination because you have the user's computer and you have the actual servers serving up the content. How how far are they? Um, this is somewhat a question of the speed of light uh, in the sense that we cannot have data go faster than speed of light. And in fact, the speed of the light in optical fiber is not even the full speed of light. It's something like 60 or 70% of the speed of light. Um, and so like there are physical limitations on even our global infrastructure, even on this planet, uh, for how fast we can make this stuff without using some of these strategies. Um, and this, this is one of the best parts about this presentation because there are only so many changes that I have to make to this every year because some of these things are just bounded by physics. Um, the, now, all of the optimizations around HTTPS over the last 10 years for performance have basically been related to um, some cryptographic ones that I'm not going to touch um, that, that about like how fast can the crypt, crypto run on like especially mobile processors, that can actually be a substantial thing. But, uh, and, and it's something that actually gets optimized often by throwing something on a CDN anyway. But I'm gonna talk about round trips. Um, round trips used to be awful for HTTPS. You used to basically have to have um, uh, a round trip to basically say hello with TCP, a round trip to, uh, to say hello for HTTP, uh, for TLS another round trip for certain negotiation with HTTPS, um, you ended up with a case where on the first request to a site for HTTPS, you could have like four plus round trips before you'd get the first byte back of the actual page. And this is on top of any time that Drupal's spending rendering the page. Like this negotiation has to happen before Drupal even gets the request. And then it, um, and even for subsequent requests for assets, there are, there are sometimes several round trips because uh, a browser tries to establish concurrent connections, especially on pre-HTTP2, um, a browser will basically try to set up a whole bunch of connections to a system and then pull content over it because that's still a lot faster to establish each of these things and pull the assets in parallel than it is to pull one asset over at a time sequentially over one connection that has been set up. The, um, we've gotten this down to basically plus one extra round trip versus HTTP in the typical case. This is a really fantastic achievement because we've gone from having HTTPS like quadruple or quintuple the, the amount of round trip overall transit time back and forth down to just basically doubling it and in some cases not even doubling it. Um, this is, we're in a very, I used to have a slide here before this one on the idea of like how some of the old stacks worked, but like the great thing today is whether you're deploying out on a modern origin system with like a fresh version of, of Nginx or whether you're using a CDN, you're probably able to take advantage of at least this reduction in round trips. Um, the, uh, this does require that you have things deployed on things like HTTP2 plus it requires that you have modern TLS. I'm talking like in, in this case for most of these, uh, either TLS 1.2 uh, or 1.3. Some of these things are really only available in 1.3, I believe, uh, for, for some of the optimizations. Um, and uh, for just security purposes, you need to be using TLS 1.2 or newer anyway. Um, there's there's base 1.1 and older have severe vulnerabilities with them. So like in some ways, like people have been kind of like in terms of a carrot and stick situation. I've always offered the carrot of performance for upgrading this stuff, but the stick has been kind of coming um, behind there 
and knocking away some of the older versions of TLS anyway. So like, um, I don't have to, to cover this point quite as much, um, but basically you can get non-get requests down to two round trips, one for the TLS negotiation um, and one for the um, uh, one for the actual request. Uh, and then uh, you can get get requests down to sometimes one. And by one round trip, I mean not even TCP. Like increasingly, some of this stuff is happening over connectionless protocols like UDP. And um, but the zero round trip time stuff is not totally achievable. And honestly, it can be kind of playing with fire from a security basis. So like um, going forward in a lot of this presentation, we're going to assume that things take at least like two round trips for the most part, uh, because the one round trip is kind of a, a, an edge case that you have to very carefully implement. Um, so let's talk about how this stuff performs when we're talking about different deployment models with CDNs versus origin infrastructure. Um, it is all about those round trips. Like I was talking about how round trip time times number of round trips. We actually spent a lot of time covering reduction in the number of round trips, where various optimizations to HTTP and TLS have reduced the number of round trips that are necessary to make. Um, like. The number of stores that we're visiting in this in this scenario of running errands is much lower than it otherwise would have been. However, there's still the question of the distance um, because both of these are factors. So um, in some ways, uh, it doesn't matter if you have to make a bunch of trips if they're super close by. If you need to make trips to corner stores in your neighborhood, then going to two or three is not actually that long. And in fact, going to two or three could be faster than going to Costco across town. So we have to care about both. Um, so in, the, in this diagram here, I know this text is pretty small, so I'm just gonna, but it, the, the deck will be available online. And I, I'm just gonna describe it. It's mostly there in case people go back and look at it so you don't have to furiously take notes if, if you wanna like look at this stuff, but basically, on top, we see the non-CDN style approach, where every connection, um, especially when you have an inefficient setup, is going um, back and forth at great distance. This like 100 to 300 millisecond re uh, round trip time on here is sort of with a cross-country model, uh, in the sense that let's say you had something deployed in the west coast and someone was accessing it on the east, or vice versa. A lot of these things get much worse as you start getting international, and I'll go over those scenarios in, in some later slides. But basically, one of the main things that a CDN does, other than caching your content, is it brings the pop close to the user. This means that those round trips suddenly become trips to a corner store instead of trips across town, uh, to, to apply that metaphor to the internet infrastructure. This essentially allows you to have far more round trips, whether it's for static assets, for various forms of TLS negotiation, in a way that's not nearly as painful. Modern CDNs have at least dozens of pops around the world, and some of them have hundreds or thousands. They are intended to be in locations that provide low latency connectivity to users and basically allow this process to be super fast. Um, they tend to establish fairly persistent connections back to your infrastructure that they use to, to use for the user requests they need to fulfill. And so even if a pop does not hit with your content, even if you cache nothing on your site whatsoever, this will dramatically speed up your performance because it means that all of this, all of this connection negotiation, especially for the parallel connections, is all happening to fairly local infrastructure. Um, for the models I'm going to go into, I'm going to like basically work through the, like, the homework of these different situations. I'm going to assume, and this is actually a pretty optimistic ass uh, assumption, that you're delivering pages out of Drupal in 200 milliseconds. Um, I Actually, uh, across Pantheon's infrastructure, I believe the average is closer to two, 300 to 400. Uh, but the, um, I can make the case that you basically cannot make Drupal fast enough to, uh, to beat the need to have a CDN. And that's why I'm using this highly optimistic time. It is possible. We have sites on Pantheon that are doing this, but it is not that common. And so basically my case is, you're not gonna be able to beat these numbers. You cannot outpace the speed of light and the effects 
um, that you need to optimize around with the CDN. So let's look at a super pessimistic case. Um, you're using an old stack, the kind that like, let's say you're deploying like a supported but not um, but not super new version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. You've fired up like Apache. Um, you've gone through all the practices to set up a site with, with HTTPS. You might have like enabled Let's Encrypt on there. Um, the site is secure from the perspective that like the connection, the, 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 um, the ciphers are good, um, the certificate's good. Um, it's, you're setting yourself up to fail though if you do this and that's the only thing you do because um, and this is basic, so this scenario is based around a half trip across the country. Like this is under the highly optimistic idea that like you, like this is kind of based around the idea that like Pantheon has its primary region in the US and Iowa. You're gonna be about halfway across the country from that. Um, if you have a similar situation, like these numbers would, would fit. Um, basically you need to double them if you go all the way across the country and it's worse for international. But working through this here, um, we're assuming a round trip time of about 45 milliseconds. Um, the, um, or maybe this is across the country. It really depends on the network you, you're on. Um, but 45 millisecond round trip time. Um, TCP, you have to do the, the hello there. T this is with older kind of TLS setups or at least not optimized where you have two round trips to set up TLS. Then you have to make the HTTP connection, and you have no HTTP two here, so you um, so the browser is having to establish connections independently for each piece of content. Even if you hit the cache, like let's say you put varnish on that server and you hit the cache, you're still at like 360 milliseconds. And then now um, with the missed page cache, um, uh, you're adding at least 200 milliseconds and then maybe some overhead depending on like where these pieces of infrastructure are. So like um, you're, uh, you're looking at like more than half a second here just before the person has got the first byte of HTTP back from your site. That is a really challenging place to be in if you need to hit a 2.4 second goal uh, for loading the whole page with all of its content because you haven't transferred a single image, CSS file, JavaScript file, run any of the JavaScript yet. Um, and that's often what is like seconds of time on a page. So like you're kind of set up to fail with that, but on a modern stack with a CDN, um, like the round trip between like my home internet connection and like San Jose for a pop is, uh, I, I live in San Francisco, uh, is like only a few milliseconds. So my round trip time uh, especially if once you have a modern stack with like modern TLS, modern HTTP, if a page is already cached in the CDN, we're looking at pretty trivial time, like under 10 milliseconds for the first byte to come back. But when you start actually missing the cache and you have a page in Drupal, you've actually still caught up a lot. Like this is even in the, this is what I'm saying in terms of like, even if you're not caching in the CDN, you will, you will still shave hundreds of milliseconds off that, off that first byte. Uh, uh, if you can deploy on a CDN, even if even if you make basically no other change to your infrastructure. Um, now, I said time to first byte is not the most important thing. It doesn't actually determine your search ranking, but it does determine when that race starts for actually do it, loading a page. Like you cannot paint a page before you have the bytes of the page, and the very first byte of the HTML is what kicks that off. Like nothing on a site can load before this first byte has been transferred. So it's more of a, a bound on what you can achieve um, than a really super key measure in and of itself at this point. But um, you don't really wanna have to re-earn those 400 milliseconds here. Like that's, like it, cause it's gonna blow that budget on like user experience. So um, let's, took, let's like cross the, the pond here and like look at a scenario where you're, you're dealing with like inter-Atlantic latencies where um, Europe to North America or vice versa. Um, you have um, all of that time gets added to the round trip time. And if you're taking a bunch of round trips across the Atlantic, it's going to be a bad time. We're now approximately a second before the first byte of content has come back from, uh, from a cache miss. We only have about a second and a half now to actually finish rendering the page before we're gonna start losing, lo losing user attention. The amount that that degrades is much, much less with a CDN. 
because someone in Europe is still able to negotiate the connection with a proximal pup uh, instead of having to go across the Atlantic. And in, in effect, what you're seeing here, latency-wise, is the, the pup has negotiated TLS and gotten the HTTP request. It has a persistent connection, generally, all the way across the Atlantic. And all it's doing is making one round trip request across the Atlantic to get that HTML. So even if you miss in Drupal, you have that round trip of the 85 milliseconds to go across the Atlantic, but you only have it once in the, in the scenario on the right, not a whole stack of those situations where it's, it's constantly um, having to make that trip just before it gets the first data. And then like it just keeps stacking up. Like this is basically from like, uh, the Pacific connections are even more high latency than the Atlantic ones. Uh, some of them come out to almost 200 milliseconds. Like if you look at some of the things like from Australia to the US, it can be really rough. Um, and basically you can see on here that if you have, even if you're serving, um, oh, I need to actually update the page cache thing on here. But like, let's say you actually had, oh no, 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 no that's correct. Cause it adds 175 milliseconds to 200. Uh, so if you, um, if you're missing the page cache in, Drup uh, in Drupal and not on a CDN, even if you're rendering the page in 200 milliseconds, we're like, vastly through our time budget here to the 2.4 seconds before the first byte of HTML has come back. Like two thirds of the way through our budget. And then on the right hand side, let's say we have a pop in like Sydney or something or in Tokyo. What we're able to do is we, we don't actually have that much of a degradation. Like look, look at how same continent we're at 251 milliseconds with a CDN versus 381. We're, we're paying the price of the one round trip, but that doesn't accumulate too fast when you actually use a CDN. So um, graphing this out, um, here's what you see. Um, now I say the goal is to hit under 500 milliseconds here because you just, you really need a second or two of time on the end user device to actually render the page. Because even if once you get all the assets on a page for a modern site with a lot of JavaScript and, and analytics and marketing frameworks, like you just need as much headroom as you can get. So you just can't achieve that without a CDN. Um, and that is like basically how I was saying, like this is the path to first paint. Um, like there you have your time to first bite, you have the actual size and content of the da data that's coming down. Um, then you have the CPU time rendering that. Um, we've been talking about that first one and then everything else you're doing here is on top of that. So it like, if you look at the graphs you see in something like Chrome and start breaking it into how long it took for the first byte of the base page to come back versus everything else, you'll generally see that the vast majority of time for a modern site is actually everything else, not the first byte. But everything else can't happen until the first byte is there. So um, I did some like basically like benchmarking on this uh, years back when I was first building up this deck. And this is what I saw in terms of the actual impacts of, of things, where uh, you can get a lot of gains by getting all those static assets onto a CDN. Like everything in your like <coughs> files directory on Drupal in a CDN is the easy path. Um, but the best thing to do is to, to actually slap a CDN over all of it. And, I, and that's like pretty much the normal practice now once you're throwing a CDN onto it. CDN onto a site, but this is basically a message. Please don't cut corners on that. Um, it can be easier to to not have the main pages go through a CDN from a configuration perspective sometimes, um, but it's got to be there. Like uh, this also means you cannot use a technique like say copying the assets out of Drupal to something like S3 and then having that be on on a CDN because you'll only get to the middle of this, and the middle of this still blows the budget or at least barely makes the budget. And remember, we're assuming that Drupal returns a page in 200 milliseconds. We're already being optimistic here about what Drupal can, can do for a substantial site. Um, this is the sort of chart I was talking about, where basically when you pull up the network diagram in your browser, you'll, you'll see um, this cascading diagram of all the assets. And this is a pretty abbreviated version of it. Um, 
where I've collapsed most of the resources into critical resource downloads and additional resource downloads. The, the difference between those is like, is the page actually blocking its paint on that? Uh, the more that you load things asynchronously, the more things will be in that last category that doesn't fully block paint. You can totally get away with certain things loading at the very end of a page. Uh, if they don't affect the paint of the page, they don't affect user interaction with the page. Google doesn't actually punish you for doing things that don't stop the user from interacting and loading the page. Um, but you can see here in this case, um, this breaks down um, a situation in a fairly common case where it's TCP, TLS, HTML. This is like HTTP2. This is like a fairly mid, mid, mid like modern stack. Like this is not bleeding edge here. This is just like pretty good configuration. Um, and this is with a standard CDN in terms of just without the. Um, well, this and by standard CDN, I'm referring to the traditional deployment model where you've just kept your static assets delivered through it, but not the page itself. Um, this collapses this time enormously. This this is related to that middle thing on this chart. And then when you go to a full CDN, um, you're just cutting those round trips enormously. And a lot of those round trips have nothing to do with the optimization you do in your PHP or database. They just have to do with the distance between a user and that infrastructure. So you, you can really cut down for the same site with no changes to the actual, um, with, to Drupal itself, the loading time, and win back a lot of that, that headroom that you need to hit that 2.4 second budget. Um, I also typically talk about, like, given that we handle about, yes? Oh, okay. Um, what we're seeing at Pantheon, um, we have, um, we're seeing modern threats ramp up a lot, and this relates to kind of like keeping your site online. Um, it used to be that like you would see some like trickle of denial of service stuff at layer seven HTTP hitting a site, and the big denial of service requests, uh, or denial of service attacks, would be typically like sub layer seven, like DNS or reflection attacks. That's changing. We're now seeing volumetric attacks at the HTTP level. And you pretty much need a CDN to mitigate that. You really can't do that on origin infrastructure. We're also seeing um, like a lot of gray hat activity in terms of probing sites where like even all the bug bounty programs and things, we're, we're seeing um, that actually attracting a lot of, in some ways, malicious behavior against sites. Not that you shouldn't have a bug bounty and reporting program, but um, there's a lot of activity to game those systems. Um, and the mitigations for a lot of these sorts of attacks that are really high level, like volumetric layer seven HTTP stuff, are really expensive and you start having to weigh whether it's uh, more cost effective to absorb the traffic than it is to block and mitigate it, especially if it means throwing up something like an I'm under attack thing from a provider like Cloudflare. Um, this, uh, these are just empirical results historically that we've seen uh, when we migrated Pantheon's infrastructure from having origin varnish to having a CDN, you can see the drops that we got. Um, it's just massive that we, what we saw. And like we also saw this like when various um, uh, plot hosting platforms were compared. Um, like we saw that like having a CDN was kind of a secret recipe to it. More platforms have this today uh, built into their infrastructure, which is awesome. Um, I'm not going to cover this because of time, because it's, it's interesting. But <laughs> um, the uh, I few, few things you should not do that have been traditional practices. Some people talk about using separate CDN domains. Don't do that. That actually increases DNS lookups in the browser and is not helpful to getting concurrent download of, of assets. Um, same thing for separate hosts for assets. And you're not really going to be um, improving the results from your site by not having HTTPS on everything. You'll just get downranked and users will have bad experiences. Um, uh, of course, um, opt, uh, basically a lot of this is covering the idea of heavily use something like Lighthouse. Um, it will measure a lot of this stuff for you and will tell you where your weak spots are. Uh, this will be online if you want to see it. Um, HTTP three is sort of like ever on the like fritz of like getting broad adoption. Honestly, this slide is like five years old, and like we're still talking about whether when like when HTTP three for everything. Um, 
a lot of it is that like some of the optimizations in it, especially around like TLS round trip time mitigation, aren't that safe. Um, and so like we're we're in a stage where like a lot of the optimizations are like pushing against security models that are challenging to to maintain when you start optimizing things further. So, um, but uh, it's definitely continuing to march along. Um, and I mentioned that the zero round trip stuff uh, for um, HTTPS is kind of halfway there. It's useful for some requests if you know exactly what you're doing. It's much, much more important that you use a CDN at all than any of this stuff. Um, and uh, basically this is covering the risks around the zero round trip time stuff for TLS. Um, it's, um, you really don't need to worry about a lot of this stuff. Like you basically just need to um, put it on a CDN, <laughs> like a good modern one. Um, uh, so all this stuff also applies to edge side coding. Like if you're starting to deploy things to um, like Cloudflare workers, um, you will start uh, having to think about where your code is running in terms of the latency of connecting to that. But you start, ha like the main caution I like to provide on this is that if you connect back to a database, as you would in the standard fashion with a system like Drupal, deploying your code to the edge may not provide you gains because if you look at how Drupal works, Drupal has far more database connections for every request than, it, than connections from the user. Like I can make one HTTP request to Drupal and I could see dozens, sometimes even hundreds of, of queries go to the database for that one request. You don't want that round trip time happening um, over great distances. You actually want your app close to your data. Uh, so that's the main caution I provide around edge side stuff. Uh, 5G is changing a lot of the mobile situation. You will see this anyway in your um, uh, in your PageSpeed Insights data, like the fact that more users on more devices have great bandwidth. Um, so uh, I think I'm already out of time, but like I will try and take questions if I can. Any, uh, I have a question. Uh, any um, improvements to the compression? So, um, if you're asking about um, some of, the, I actually have a on one of these slides. Um, do, 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 uh, oh, that's compressed image. So, I mean, compressed images effectively is not a CDN thing, but modern compression formats like WebP are uh, do get an edge um, in some of how browsers handle them. Uh, there is a different compression standard that um, that HTTP2 and newer can support. Uh, it's actually really kind of hard to deploy um, because of the way it interacts with, with your other data. And it has some security implications too in terms of like making content slightly guessable. Uh, it, I'm trying to remember the name of the compression format, but like we're still using just the gzip stuff at Pantheon because the newer um, compression formats have challenges and don't and will not move the data uh, will not move the needle enough for uh, to to take the risks on some of them. Um, gosh, what is the name of that one? Um, it's Rotley. Sorry, Rotley. That's it. Yes, um, it it's something you can do. Like we we haven't seen it move results a lot. I suspect it matters more for like underpowered devices that ha that would be spending more time like managing gzipped content. Um, it, some of that really starts mattering if you're deploying to developing areas. Like there are a lot of very slow phones if you need your app to be available in a place like India. Um, and then I would start looking at Brutley compression and stuff like that because like every little bit of burden you can take off that end user device that is going to be just pegged on its CPU can matter. Um, but if you're focusing mostly on like um, North America and Europe, I don't think it's going to make a big difference. I don't know that it, fun it it makes enough of a difference. Like it's probably going to make a much bigger difference what JavaScript is loading on the page than what compression format the page used. Like you mentioned 
Oh, did I? You mentioned not running Drupal on a, on a CDN because all the way back in the no, no, I'm, yeah, ba deploying Drupal itself to the edge. Right, so what about the decoupled application where the front end is deployed to the edge to make the API request? If you can manage the, the um, request, so it depends on what, what request the decoupled application makes. If the decoupled application needs to make a request back to origin on every single request, you're just not going to get a gain from it. Because even though it will connect the decoupled application close by, if that decoupled application has to go all the way back to origin, you pretty much may as well have the whole request go back to origin, and it'll be cheaper to run the app, and it won't make, be any slower. Well, for statically rendering the pages. If you statically render the pages, then it totally makes sense to deploy that out to the edge. Because then there's no round trip. Um, or if you can, or if you replicate data for it to a system like Cloudflare KV store or something that replicates out, if you can have the data be close to you and not have to go back to origin, then that's that can make a big difference. A similar question, yeah, like, or if you have authenticated requests, like you're actually running web application and users log in to it, would it still make sense then to try to push the static assets if possible to CDN or, you know, because you're never going to get the page content on the CDN? Yeah, uh, it absolutely makes sense. And in fact, that is the default for how Pantheon functions. That even for authenticated uh, activity on a site, for requests that go to paths that are not protected file directories, we will strip the cookie and then try and handle the request as if basically the person didn't have an active session. Because generally for unprotected assets, it doesn't matter. If a site did it protect that asset, what would happen in our infrastructure is it would still fail safely in the sense that because we stripped the session, it gets handled as an unauthenticated request. And that means that on, on Pantheon at least, um, all of those static assets typically get loaded off the local pup uh, without having to go back to origin. I would encourage doing a similar configuration. It's not possible on every CDN uh, or uh, because you, I mean, the browser will send the cookie for everything. Sometimes that is the one case if you cannot do it in this, if you cannot strip the session in the CDN, it's the one case where it can make sense to possibly have a different domain for it. But it's more efficient to do what we're doing, which is to have everything on the same domain and to strip the session off of everything going to the static paths. Is it fastly, the youngest fastly? We use fastly for the most part. Uh, our front end sites stuff is actually on Cloudflare though. Is there a reason for that distinction? Um, we are, I mean, we're exploring our opportunities with CDNs right now, I would say, like in terms of like the integrations, um, because Cloudflare has workers, Fastly has computed edge. They work very differently. Um, a lot of our engineers are pretty excited about the Cloudflare workers model, and it has, um, it's slightly more mature as an implementation than Fastly's in the sense that like the supportive services at Cloudflare run things like the KV store to actually build edge applications that are non-trivial is, is better. And the workers are like Lambda? Workers are a lot like Lambda, yeah. Um, well, actually, actually, they, they are not like, they're a lot like Lambda, they're not like Lambda at Edge. Um, Lambda at Edge actually works a completely different way than regular Lambda. Lambda at Edge has you insert things into like the HTTP state machine, almost like you're configuring Varnish. And Lambda at Edge will charge you for a Lambda request for each part of like the HTTP lifecycle that you want to plug into. So uh, whereas Cloudflare workers, it works just like regular Lambda where like you just write a function, at, although in the case of Cloudflare workers, generally in JavaScript, push it up and it's a normal thing where the request comes in, it runs your function, it returns the result. Um, I don't really recommend using Lambda at Edge unless you like really, really know what you're doing exactly, like, and have a very specific use case. Like, if you were doing like an IoT infrastructure and collecting data from them, and you just wanted them to be able to send off a quick thing and collect it, like, I can maybe imagine using it for like a super specialized application. Sure.